you to the seventh annual CODADAD lecture on the neurobiology of excessive pathological selfishness. Every year, um, we gather, thanks to uh, Garriman and his family's support for these lectures, and we bring together people from all over the university to think together about selfishness versus other considerations, selfishness versus altruism versus extreme selfishness, um, and to try to understand the neurobiological substrates of this problem. Let's see if this works. Yes, this is very much in keeping with the mission of the Center for Neuroscience and Society, which is to increase understanding of neuroscience and society and their relation, and also to encourage the responsible use of neuroscience for the benefit of humanity. And it certainly will benefit humanity if we can figure out what it is about brain function that leads some people to be what Garriman would call excessively pathologically selfish. Um, so let me begin by telling you a little bit about um, Garriman Kodadad, who has generally su bleh, generously supported this lecture series, um, along with his two sons, uh, Rossi and Victor. Um, and Victor Kodadad is here with him today. Uh, the Garriman and uh, Victor are in the front row here next to Joe Cable. Um, Dr. Garriman Kodadad came to the U.S. from Iran and did his residency in neurosurgery at Penn. He carried out research at the University of Toronto, then returned briefly to Penn, and then he joined the faculty of the University of Cincinnati Medical School where um, he developed uh, vascular surgery techniques that help save lives and save brain function of his patients. And as long as I am using slides for this introduction, I am going to hopefully not embarrass Garman too much by showing you um, newspaper coverage of, of one of his uh, uh, developments, one of his advances. Um, uh, I, I like this picture particularly because the resemblance between the young Dr. Kodadad and the current Victor Kodadad is so striking. Um, together uh, with his sons, Garriman has set up a family foundation dedicated to improving human life by better understanding the biological roots of excessive pathological selfishness. Um, which he distinguishes from normal adaptive selfishness that we all possess for our own self-preservation um, because it is, uh, it is extreme and has a corrosive effect on human life and on society. Um, Derriman and his son have become a good friend of the Center for Neuroscience and Society and in the past, we have enjoyed thanking him each year with a vigorous round of applause. However, starting last year, he said, enough, we please no more applause. So just beam your silent appreciation uh, <laughs> to Garman and Victor. And with that, I want to introduce our speaker today on the subject of excessive pathological selfishness, Molly Crockett. Um, Molly is currently an assistant professor at Yale University in the psychology department. Um, she got her bachelor's degree uh, from UCLA, working with Matthew Lieberman, one of the early pioneers of social neuroscience. She went on to get her PhD at the University of Cambridge, working with Trevor Robbins. Um, and. Uh, in the course of her time since then, has held positions at Oxford, where she was on the faculty, at University College London, where she did a postdoctoral fellowship, um, 
Zurich, University of Zurich. Um, she has uh, she's been many places and done many things, including picked up a kind of stunning long list of awards. I won't try to read all of them, but I will say uh, S SPSP, Society for Personality and Social Psychology, sort of key psychology group, the Daniel M. Wegner Theoretical Innovation Prize for 2019, so that must be the latest, I assume. Um, Society for Neuroeconomics Early Career Award, um, Sage Young Award Scholar, Society for Personality and Social Psychology last year, World Economic Forum, Young Global Leader, um, Association for Psychological Science Rising Star, um, Wow, Einhorn Young Investigator Award, Society for Judgment and Decision Making, Early Career Award, Society for Social Neuroscience, um, uh, European Brain and Behavior Society Young Investigator Award, and as you can tell, I'm skipping over some things because there's so many, um, and I want to save time for our talk. So the thing is, um, before I hand the podium over to Molly, I want to just to clarify some terminology that we have spent a fair amount of time talking about today, uh, Molly, Garriman, Victor, and I, about what is meant by selfishness. Um, Garriman points out that selfishness per se is not a terrible thing, that we have all evolved the drive to look after ourselves. And in that sense, selfishness is normal and adaptive. The problem comes when people become extreme in their selfishness. So I am going to just throw up some terms that have come out today. Um, selfish, selfless, um, as in Molly's title, does not mean Selfish does not mean just healthy, adaptive selfishness. And selfless does not mean, please, take everything. Take my organs for transplants. You know, I, I don't care for anything for myself. It means becoming less severely selfish. Um, altruism is another word for being relatively less selfish, relatively more other regarding. Um, and EPS is an abbreviation that has arisen over the last few years, um, standing for excessive pathological selfishness. So I just want to sort of map out that territory for you so you don't think that the, the goal of the Cotadad Family Foundation is to make us all offer ourselves as organ donors, <laughs> but rather to just um, rein in to more pro-social uh, levels, our natural selfishness. And I've also posted here um, the, really the first paragraph in the research section of Molly's website, which I think goes right to the heart of this issue of trading off benefits to ourselves with costs to other people. And what she has done beautifully over the last you know, decade of her work is show using multiple methods from imaging to psychopharmacology um, what brain systems, what cognitive systems underlie that ability to hit a, a healthy balance here between these opposing forces. Um, so without further ado, I'm thrilled to over to Molly. Great. Thank you so much for having me here. It's a real pleasure. Um, Martha gave a great introduction, so I'm just going to jump right in. In 1886, Robert Louis Stevenson published what is now the famous tale of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And in this story, just a few sips of a strange potion transform the very upstanding Dr. Jekyll into the murderous brute, Mr. Hyde. Now, of course, this story is science fiction, but 
recent work in neuroscience has shown that subtle manipulations of brain chemistry can change the way people make social decisions and judgments. Not, of course, to the extreme degree as depicted in uh, Jekyll and Hyde, but subtle changes that can tell us something about the neurobiology of social behavior. In fact, some of this recent work has spurred philosophers like Ingmar Persson and Julian Savulescu to declare that we should be developing biomedical interventions to enhance human morality. In their book, Unfit for the Future, they write, uh, they, they argue that the future of our species depends on our urgently finding ways to bring about radical enhancement of the moral aspects of our own human nature. And they maintain it's likely we may need to explore the use of new technologies of biomedicine to change the basis of human moral motivation. Now, I have been doing work on the psychopharmacology of human morality and social behavior for the past 12 years. Um, I talk about this work publicly quite a lot. Um, I have been misinterpreted. Um, for example, uh, these articles were written uh, quoting me as saying morality pills were close to reality. Uh, this is false. <laughs> so I just want to take a moment to say unequivocally that this is not the case. We are not at all close to developing morality pills or anything of the sort. And that prospect is, is ridiculous on many fronts. Um, so I'm not going to talk about that today per se. Um, nevertheless, social neuroscience has made great advancements in understanding how different pharmacological substances, um, both artificial and natural, can alter human social behavior. And I'm going to share some of that work um, that I've been doing today. So the talk today is going to have three parts. Um, hopefully we'll have time to get to all of them. Um, in the first part, I'll discuss um, some pharmacological studies that we've done in the lab where we, we give people substances that manipulate their brain chemistry and we observe the causal effects of those manipulations on behavior. The second part is going to look at observational correlational studies um, of psychopharmacology in the wild. Um, humans take substances uh, for recreational use and we have gone out into places where people take those substances of their own accord and measured their social behavior, emotions, uh, and judgments, and, and looked for connections there. And in the last part of the talk, we noticed that at these events that we went to, um, we observed transformative experiences and changes in pro-social behavior in our participants who were not on substances. And so there may actually be something about coming together in a mass gathering and collectively engaging socially with other humans that can induce some of the same changes that we see pharmacologically. So if you wanted to pharmacologically alter moral social cognition in the lab, which neurotransmitter system would you target? Anyone who doesn't know my work want to take a guess? It's serotonin. And when I started working in this area about 12 years ago, this was a really obvious starting point because research um, dating back many de decades has demonstrated a link between serotonin and many different aspects of social behavior in a wide range of species, some of which are shown here, which range from invertebrates uh, like, um, like locusts uh, whose swarming behavior is affected by serotonin all the way uh, up through mammals and uh, including primates and humans. And um, this relationship seems to follow a pretty consistent pattern across these species, um, where if you map out sort of the general correlation between uh, serotonin function and the frequency of pro-social and anti-social behaviors, um, generally um, intact or enhanced serotonin function is positively correlated with pro-social behaviors and negatively correlated with anti-social behaviors. So this was, was pretty well established in the literature when I started working in this um, more than a decade ago. Um, but the, the precise psychological and cognitive neural mechanisms driving these relationships were not yet clear. So when we started this, we, we turned to methods from behavioral economics, um, which uh, over, over the years have, have developed a, a toolkit, if you will, for really precisely measuring uh, human preferences including what we call social preferences, which is to say uh, humans are, are selfish and we care about our own welfare, but we also care about the welfare of other people, and we care about abstract social principles like fairness and justice and morality more broadly. 
So one way to measure very precisely these social preferences is an interaction called the ultimatum game. And the ultimatum game has two players, a proposer and a responder. Uh, the proposer gets some money and decides, proposes, how to split that money with the responder. The responder can then accept the offer, in which case both players are paid accordingly, or the responder can reject the offer, in which case the money disappears, nobody gets paid. So this game has been widely studied across many different fields, and it's been, it's been used to show that um, if humans only cared about uh, their own self-interest, um, then the, the proposer would offer the minimum amount possible and the responder would always reject it or accept it because some money is better than no money. Um, but this is in fact not what happens. There have been hundreds of studies with the ultimatum game now and what's typically observed is that responders would reject uh, offers they think are unfair, which is typically uh, less than about 30% of the total pie. Um, proposers anticipating this tend to offer around 30 to 40% of the total pie. So what this shows is that a lot of people would rather have nothing than see somebody uh, who's behaved unfairly towards them get the lion's share of uh, the earnings. And this has been demonstrated across many different cultures. Uh, it emerges at a fairly young age. It's a really uh, stable social behavior. We wanted to see how, uh, how serotonin uh, in the brain might influence decisions to accept or reject unfair offers, um, which have been conceptualized as a kind of, of punishment decision. So if you reject an unfair offer, you're incurring a personal cost to punish somebody who has behaved unfairly towards you. We've used a couple different methods to manipulate serotonin function in the lab. Um, one method is called acute tryptophan depletion, or ATD. Um, this is a dietary manipulation. It temporarily lowers brain serotonin levels by depriving the brain of the raw ingredient for serotonin, um, which is the amino acid tryptophan. So we, and we have subjects um, fast from the night before, and they come into the lab in the morning, we give them this protein shake. Uh, it tastes really disgusting, actually. Um, but it contains all the amino acids that you would normally get from your diet, except it has no tryptophan in it. So when you have this influx of amino acids, your brain starts to um, starts to t take those in and um, they compete at the blood-brain barrier with any tryptophan that might be floating over uh, from, from yesterday's meal. And so about five hours after you drink this, um, the brain is in a lowered serotonin state. And we compare behavior following the depletion condition um, with behavior after a placebo treatment, which looks and tastes the same except for it does contain tryptophan, um, so it doesn't change uh, serotonin levels in the placebo treatment. So depletion is a way to, to lower or impair serotonin function in the brain. Um, to induce the, the opposite effect, we can enhance serotonin function temporarily with a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, or SSRI. It's a class of drugs that's typically used uh, to treat, for example, depression and anxiety. Um, it works by blocking the reuptake of serotonin at the synapse. Um, so uh, about an hour and a half after you take this drug, um, serotonin uh, has more time to act at its receptors postsynaptically. So this en enhances serotonergic neurotransmission. So in several studies, we have used these manipulations to see how uh, enhancing or impairing serotonin function affects punishment decisions in the ultimatum game. Um, this is results from uh, the placebo condition of our first uh, study that we did. And you can see when the offer is unfair, people are rejecting it uh, quite a lot of the time, the majority of the time. Um, as, the re as the proportion um, becomes more fair, so going from 30 uh, to 50 percent, then people uh, become less likely to reject those offers. When we deplete serotonin levels, um, we see an increase in rejection of unfair offers. So lowering serotonin seems to increase people's taste for punishment. What happens when we enhance serotonin function with the SSRI? We see the opposite effect. So here, uh, punishment rates are reduced compared to placebo. So this work suggests that serotonin regulates preferences for punishing uh, people who have uh, been perceived to behave unfairly. Um, we've also looked at how uh, similar manipulations affect people's moral judgments. Um, so moral judgments, of course, are related to punishment. Um, 
In this case, we used a set of, uh, of, of thought experiments, of hypothetical dilemmas that have been widely used in the moral psychology literature, uh, known as the trolley problem. So um, we looked at uh, scenarios, uh, for example, the classic trolley problem, where the trolley is headed down some tracks towards five people um, who will be hit by the trolley if you do nothing, but you could flip a switch and divert the trolley onto a different set of tracks where it will hit one person instead of five. And the question is, is it morally acceptable to flip the switch, yes or no? Um, most people say yes in this case. Most people say it's better to save, one, uh, to save five people than one person, and so it's acceptable uh, to, to harm one person to save many others. Um, here though, the harm is not very salient. You're flipping a switch. It's not a very emotionally evocative scenario. You can compare this scenario to um, what, what Josh Green, who, who developed some of these uh, scenarios for psychology studies, called personal scenarios, which have a very highly salient harm. In this case, you're standing on a bridge over the tracks um, along with a very large person who you realize you could push off the bridge uh, and would fall onto the tracks, um, his body would stop the trolley before it hits the five workers. Again, harming one to save five, but whereas most people say it's okay to do that in the impersonal scenario, they say it's not okay to do that in the personal scenario. We, of course, were interested in how serotonin manipulation would influence judgments in these two kinds of cases. Um, we compared uh, citalopram, the SSRI, like I showed you before, uh, against a, another drug, um, a noradrenaline reuptake inhibitor, um, adamoxetine. It works through a similar mechanism by blocking the reuptake, reuptake um, but it's, it's, it's in a reuptake inhibitor for the noradrenaline transporter uh, rather than the serotonin transporter. We compared both of these treatments against placebo for neutral scenarios that didn't have any moral content, um, the impersonal scenarios that involve sacrificing one to save five, but not in a very emotionally salient way, and the personal scenarios, which involve very emotionally salient harms. There's no difference between these drug treatments in the neutral condition or for the impersonal scenarios where the harm is not very salient. But in those cases uh, where the harm is very salient, like pushing somebody off a bridge so their body can stop a train, here we see a, a significant reduction in the acceptability of harming one to save many others um, following the SSRI drug compared to the other two treatments. So we interpreted these findings as suggesting that um, boosting serotonergic neurotransmission in the brain increases harm aversion, both in the moral judgments in this study, but also in, in the decisions to, to harm financially somebody who has behaved unfairly. So a unifying principle, if you will, across these studies is that when serotonergic neurotransmission is enhanced, this seems to make people more harm averse across different contexts. But of course, moral judgments and punishment decisions are not really direct tests of the harm aversion hypothesis. So when I moved to my postdoc at UCL, um, I developed a, a method to measure harm aversion more directly. And so with my colleagues at UCL, we developed a task where people traded off money for themselves against moderately painful electric shocks delivered either to themselves or to a stranger. And so what, is, what essentially we're able to measure here is um, how averse it is uh, to deliver harm to others and how much people would be willing to pay to avoid doing that. The way that this paradigm works is we bring, uh, we bring two people into, into the lab. They arrive at different times so they don't interact face to face or see one another. They're strangers to one another. They take part in a random drawing. Um, and one subject gets uh, assigned to the role of decider and the other gets assigned to the role of receiver. Now, before either of them know what's about to happen next, um, we hook them up to an electric stimulation device and we, uh, we determine what their threshold for pain is. So these shocks uh, start at a very low level. Um, you can increase the uh, intensity of the shock and they become quite aversive. Um, we create an individually tailored shock stim stimulus for every participant in the study. Um, where we gradually increase the level until they tell us to stop, they don't want to take any more. And then we set the level of the shock for the remainder of this experiment at 80% of the maximum. So these shocks are not 
intolerable by our subjects, but they're, they're unpleasant enough that people are willing to pay money to avoid getting them themselves. They feel a little bit like running your hand under a, a faucet that's gotten too hot for half a second. So we've got the pain thresholds, and um, we've assigned the subjects to the roles of decider and receiver. And then the decider completes a task where they make a series of choices that look like this. They have to decide between a smaller number of shocks for less money versus more shocks for more money. So in this example, seven shocks for $10 versus 10 shocks for $15. The money is always for the decider who's making these choices. The shocks are half the time also for the decider. So this is how much am I willing to pay to prevent myself from getting shocked. And the other half the time, the money is still for the decider, but the shocks are now for the receiver, the stranger in the other room. So um, these are choices where people have to trade off their own financial gain against pain for either themselves or another person. We have our participants make a series of choices where we vary randomly the amounts of money at stake and the amount of pain at stake. And this allows us to describe patterns of decision making um, with a simple computational model um, that shows people derive value, this is delta V, um, from trading off profit and pain. Money is delta M and uh, shocks are delta S. Um, according to an exchange rate, um, which is our harm aversion parameter, kappa here. And um, kappa quantifies the cost of pain for self and other, it's our measure of harm aversion. And here I'm plotting, uh, I'm plotting our harm aversion parameter, which goes from zero to one, against um, the willingness to pay in dollars to reduce your shocks or the other person's shocks by one shock. Um, so essentially, as harm aversion goes towards one, you become increasingly harm averse. You'll pay more and more money to avoid even a single extra shock. As it goes towards zero, um, people become profit maximizing. So um, just to give you a sense of uh, how, uh, how participants in our studies value these shocks, um, at the upper end of the harm aversion scale, we have participants who refuse to deliver a single additional shock to the other person, even for a profit of $30. And these are students, so that's quite a lot of money for them. At the other end of the spectrum, we have people who are willing to deliver 20 extra shocks to the other person for a gain of 10 cents for themselves. So quite a wide range of preferences in this paradigm. What's remarkable, though, is that when we compare how much money people require to deliver shocks to those themselves versus others, if we compare harm aversion for self and other, what we find is that people require more money to shock a stranger than to shock themselves. Or people are more harm averse towards harming others um, compared with their own pain. And this is this is quite remarkable. When we first observed this, there were not uh, there were not uh, many popular economic models at the time um, that would have predicted this behavior. But in hindsight, of course, it does make a lot of sense. When you shock yourself for money, you get the money, and the shock is over. If you shock somebody else for money, you get the money, but you also have to live with the fact that you shock somebody uh, for money. And that's that's something that um, a lot of work uh, before our study has shown. Uh, has uh, negative utility, so, so guilt is, is, is something that people generally try to avoid. So um, this is the results from the first study we did. We've since replicated this in, in many other studies. If you take the difference in harm aversion between self and other and plot participants from um, the, the most uh, differentially harm averse uh, uh, to, uh, to the least, you get something that looks like this. So. Um, the majority of our subjects have more harm aversion for others than self. Those are the blue subjects. Um, it's usually about 60 to 70 percent of samples that we have tested. Now, this is just for behavioral results. Of course, our prediction was that serotonin um, would modulate harm aversion. Um, so we randomly assigned uh, volunteers to receive either citalopram, the SSRI that enhances serotonin transmission, or placebo. And our work before was agnostic about whether harm aversion would be increased following this treatment um, for self, uh, others, 
or both. We were predicting that it would increase for others, but um, in this case, we, we saw a general across the board increase in harm aversion. This is a really large effect, in fact. Um, this drug doubled the amount of money per shock people re required to shock both themselves and others. It didn't affect the difference in harm aversion between self and others, though. So here um, at the top is participants on placebo. We're seeing um, similar proportions of subjects who require more to shock another than themselves um, on the placebo treatment and on the drug treatment. So to summarize the, the first set of studies, in the lab we found that systemic manipulations of serotonin influence moral judgment and behavior. Costly punishment of unfairness, utilitarian moral judgments, and harming others as well as oneself for personal profit. And these results are consistent with past work which has all built towards this idea that serotonin uh, in the brain shifts preferences towards pro-sociality. Pro that's the end of part one.